What was the idea behind the Craft Museum? Uh, the prime movers, I think, uh, were first of all Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and uh, later on uh, Mrs. Pupul Jaikar. And then there were associations of uh, uh, people like Martin Singh and uh, so on. And uh, the prime idea behind the Craft Museum was that there were, uh, it, was, it became known when we became independent that India had about at least 35 million craftsmen and weavers who were practicing their crafts and weaving and who were self-employed and they needed a kind of reference to their own tradition because in the villages these traditions were com completely lost. So the things that were woven or made by their own forefathers, the craftsmen and weavers had no access to and therefore they wanted to see uh, what their tradition looked like uh, and uh, a collection that we possess about of 20,000 objects that becomes a kind of reference material for these crafts people to come and see on mm -hmm. the one side mm -hmm. and other side the idea was to get craftsmen across to Delhi so that they can familiarize themselves with the urban new clientele because formerly the craftsmen were catering to uh, village clientele and they made things in the villages and sold in villages and at the most they went to nearby cities but now their complete clientele meaning patronage has shifted to big cities and therefore uh, the craftsmen they, when they come to Delhi they are able to uh, meet their new clients. Right, uh, there is often a criticism that the management is now fossilizing living arts and also that the art that you produce here is uh, far above the reach of the common man. What do you have to say to that? Uh, I think once upon a time the goods were made for the common man in the villages. Now that they are making goods for uh, their, uh, their clientele which is far removed from their own perception, they do not know so much about the life of the people to whom they are selling and as a result uh, you know that, that contact is lost so what they are making is a kind of mass production for mass consumption and uh, in that you know the quality uh, goes down because it is not uh, made specifically do you want me can to we do it's all right to do that yeah. so in case <laughs> like you're know. but if it is too many times yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 but then there were too many Rolling. Okay, uh, the question I was asking was that there is a criticism about the Craft Museum yeah. that uh, you are fossilizing living arts and yeah. the art that is produced here is far above the reach of the common man. What do you have to say to that, Dr. Chair? I think the common man was originally the, the man who lived in the villages and in proximity with the craftsmen and weavers. That was really the common man who naturally patronized uh, the uh, crafts and uh, textiles of India. Once that relationship was really broken between the natural craftsman living in his natural surrounding and in the social surrounding of his natural clientele, once that happened and when the craft shifted to big cities, then I think the question of uh, uh, crafts becoming beyond the reach of ordinary man, etc., has to be dealt with in a different context. That what happened is that now they are making things for the people whom they do not know. So they are in a way kind of making a lot of things for a clientele that is not known to them and in that surrounding I think the question is of quality and that quality if that handmade quality that individual expression if that is missing in the crafts then there is no difference between industrial production and handicraft and if we really mean that there is something like individuals, uh, individuals own expression that comes into the craft, meaning one individual puts himself into the product that he makes. If that is important and if that is quality, then I think one has to differentiate between mass produced crafts which are churned out like that, lifeless replicas of crafts that are churned out, that is very different than an individual creation. And what I feel is that what we are having at the Crafts Museum is to a large extent that reflection of an individual's uh, inner qualities. And for that, uh, I think the craft sometimes does become a bit more expensive and mm -hmm. therefore this criticism uh, that uh, craft is not available at the craft museum and right. uh, in common man's reach. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, if we are going to make them into mass production and lifeless, then I think crafts would be cheaper also. But why should we do that? Then why not buy industrial goods? Why make something which is creative and individual made? Mm -hmm. 
Would you say that this is a kind of a patron of, uh, of the arts, the craft museum itself? Does it play the role of maybe the Maharajas of old? Is the government stepped in today as a patron of arts? Would uh, you say I think, that? Uh, yes, more than patron of arts, I would say that the crafts museum is becoming quite a custodian of quality in handicrafts because on the one side we have this great collection of uh, 20,000 items of Indian handicrafts and textiles from 16th century to modern times. And uh, uh, on the other side, uh, craftsmen come and live with us and they are given exposure to contemporary urban life in India. Since we become a bridge between, uh, between the modern and the traditional for the craftsmen, uh, I think uh, that we are playing a role because in ancient times also when Maharajas patronized crafts, uh, the quality went up because it was not only the skill of the craftsman which was important, but it was the vision of the patron, you know. So that vision today is missing and that vision either can be given by a designer or by a museum like ours which has the means, the tradition and modernity. Great. Yeah. Now, do you have, um, what are the other activities of the museum apart from uh, what you, you know, have The told main us? sections of the museum are three. One is the six galleries and the visual store for reference in which we have these uh, 20,000 objects of textiles and handicraft. The second part of our museum is the village complex in which we try and preserve the traditional architecture of India. So from different parts of India, we have built huts and courtyards in facsimile. And uh, there, in these houses, we have displayed things the way they would be used by villagers. So a kind of cultural context is uh, created here. Mm -hmm. And therefore, something that was in the village has been recontextualized in the village uh, environment of the museum. That is second. And the third component is the uh, craft demonstration program where we get craftsmen. Every month, 50 craftsmen come to us and stay with us for 30 days. They go and next batch of the 50 craftsmen would come and stay with us. And here we also have certain performing arts like puppetry or uh, uh, pod reading or uh, dances and uh, things like that. And we have a major educational program here. And in a year, about 80,000 to 1 lakh children come and participate uh, in the craft demonstrations of the craftsmen at the museum. Mm -hmm. So these are the main activities of the museum. I see. Do you also do exhibitions abroad? We have done a large number of exhibitions abroad. We have exhibited in Soviet Union, in the United States, in Great Britain, in Sweden, in Switzerland, uh, in Austria. The last exhibition we did was in Austria. And uh, I was told that four lakhs of visitors, 400,000 visitors came in a small town in Lower Austria, which was a kind of history. It was in a 16th century castle that this exhibition was organized and it was a great success. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your future plans for the museum? Uh, I think in the future we want to increase our performing arts activities because I feel that we have started to look arts in isolation, uh, at arts in isolation. So we think uh, there's one crafts museum of India, there's another museum which is of classical arts of India, there's third museum which is of contemporary arts of India, as if, uh, and then there are performing arts and literature and oral traditions of India. Now all these, for these, you know, we have built separate institutions and academies as if in the real cultural context, literature existed separately. Oral tradition was still separate. Performing arts were separate. Crafts were separate. It was not so. If one went to traditional Indian village, one would find that all these were interrelated. And therefore, I feel that crafts were so much a part of performing arts also that we would like to make uh, or like to recontextualize all these traditions of Indian craft and performing arts and oral traditions into one and would like to present them as more a unified whole rather than isolated entities. Oh, great. Good luck to you, Dr. Jain. And Thank one you. last question yes. is uh, a little bit about the man behind the cement and mortar of this place, uh, uh, well, Charles Correa. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Charles is such an eminent architect and uh, such a creative architect and uh, Charles and I uh, worked together on building this museum and we were so delighted because Charles also felt that first time he had a client who said that architect should not only translate uh, 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 his drawings into a building 
uh, with the help of some kind of uh, uh, civil engineers who brick by brick, uh, you know. But like, you know, if you have an artist and he's painting on a canvas, the artist has freedom to wipe out and repaint and wipe out and repaint. Like that architect to some extent should have a freedom to improvise his building. And that freedom he experienced when we were uh, working on Crafts Museum and he was very delighted and that's why he calls the, the whole museum a kind of uh, 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 a metaphor of an Indian village street that we have reconstructed the village street. We have not imitated the village street but we have reconstructed, we have done a kind of modern interpretation into a building of a village street which is never complete. You know, uh, all sorts of things happen in a street, you know. And like that here, uh, unknown, unpredictable things keep happening. So uh, it was a great experience working with Charles Correa. And I think it was uh, a lot due to his imagination that this low-lying building and, and these passages and courtyards and passages and courtyards surrounded by galleries and working spaces uh, came up and a visitor feels here so comfortable whether he comes from uh, a, a very rich country or he comes from an Indian village. He feels very comfortable here because the scale of the construction, the building, the gallery, the trees, everything is such that uh, you know you don't feel left out, you feel a part of it. Great. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you.